I'm Peter Sharoshi, I'm the editor of the Drug Reporter website, and I'm sitting here at the Vienna International Center at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs with Tara Snap, the director of uh, Instituto RIA, uh, which is an advocacy organization based in Mexico City. So, Sarah, last time we were speaking here, you were very enthusiastic. That was uh, the time when the new government was elected and President Obrador just announced that he supports uh, cannabis legalization. And we were just after the Supreme Court decision, I think, that mm -hmm. that kind of lifted the ban on the use of cannabis. Yeah. And we still don't see the legalization is happening in Mexico, right? That's correct. So probably the last time we spoke was in March 2020. and. We were in this very strong legislative process and um, with a lot of motivation and a lot of momentum. So um, during the pandemic, obviously that got slowed and kind of got stagnant. And what happened was that the Senate approved an initiative, a bill with over overwhelming majority in the Senate to regulate cannabis with a social justice focus. And then they sent it to the Congress, and uh, the Congress asked for more time to be able to discuss the issue. And so they did a bunch of reforms or a bunch of changes to that bill, and they approved their own bill in March 2021. And so then they sent it back to the Senate, and the Senate said, mm, we don't like these changes you've made. We're a little bit offended that you would make so many changes. We're not gonna approve it. And so they didn't do anything. And so then it just kind of stopped. And the Supreme Court limit, the, the deadline, came and went, and they didn't do anything. And so then the Supreme Court did what they needed to do constitutionally, which was to omit a general declaration of inconstitutionality, which is only the second time in the history of Mexico that this had happened, which is essentially legislating from the bench. And they changed the general health law to remove that uh, you can get a permit or a, a sanitary authorization for personal use of cannabis only for medical or scientific use. So they took out the exclusive medical or scientific, opening the door to, as you say, personal or adult use. And that was the big change no, that one could say happened. So now if you're an adult who wants to ha have access to cannabis, you go to the regulatory body, you ask for permission. They're still saying no, even though they should say yes from the beginning. They say they don't have any internal guidelines on this, but they would have to write the internal guidelines. So they say, we don't have them. We say no to you. You go to a judge. You say they're not complying with the general declaration. And you and the judge says, you're right. You take that. You go to the COFEPRIS, the regulatory body, and then they give you your sanitary uh, authorization. So it's a very onerous uh, bureaucratic process um, that we know less than 20% of the people who begin the process, who turn in their papers, less than 20% conclude the process. And so we have 80% of people who are trying to um, legalize themselves, to say it that way, to protect themselves. And because it's so bureaucratic and you need lawyers, they're not able to, to finish that process. Is there a risk that the police will intervene in this anyhow? Like if, if, you, if you don't get the permission in time or? I mean, people are being stopped every day for simple possession of cannabis. And if you don't have your permission, then the most likely scenario is that they're going to extract money from you, extort you, okay. say, you need to pay us X amount of money. And if you don't have the money, but it looks like you could have the money, they say, it's fine, we'll take you to the um, cash machine to take out money. And so it's a, it's a thing that is fomenting daily corruption and it's putting people who use cannabis at risk because then you don't have a legal recourse. And so while we don't think that you should need permission to be able to cultivate for personal use, for home grow, we think that it's a way to protect yourself if you do participate in any way in the illegal cannabis market because then if they find you with plants, if they find you possessing, you at least have some protection. Because otherwise, we know that the police beat people up. We know that if you're a woman, uh, sexual torture is more possible. Um, and so these are, these are really disturbing, no? It's, it's, it, it, it exposes you to abuse by the authority and it continues to foment then this corruption and we believe that it's really important for us to be able to guarantee the human rights of people who use drugs. So some advocates are saying that there are some powerful uh, forces be behind 
President Obrador's reluctance to support regulation on cannabis. And some people say that it is because of the military's yeah. resistance. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that there's there's two pieces that are that have not allowed us to move forward with legislation around a, f a more integrated regulation. Um, and that really has to do with the military and their historic role in the illegal drug markets of all drugs. And that maybe they don't see the benefits of regulating because they have certain interests in maintaining um, the status quo. And I think that's a reality and we need to be able to articulate and speak to that. And also to find what are the incentives to get the armed forces and the military to want to change that. Um, because they're an actor that's very important. And militarization in Mexico has only been deepened under this president, although his two big campaign promises, the reason I voted for him and many other people, was that he was going to demilitarize and take the military back to their cuarteles, back to their, uh, their places, and that he was going to regulate cannabis. Neither of those things have happened, so there's a, a big disappointment um, because we expected something different and instead we see the military on a daily basis, they're all around us, and it doesn't make you feel safer. And so without a doubt, I think it's a, a, it's a role, um, they're an actor that we need to engage with and have conversations with. And then the other piece is the reality that our president is quite conservative, personally, and he's afraid of what would happen if more drugs were available to our young people. He has installed and implemented a very uh, fear-mongering campaign, prevention campaign, um, that is very stigmatizing, that is not based in evidence, and that is very disturbing for people who have any sort of relationship with people who use drugs. Um, and for people who use drugs, it's horrible to, to see these campaigns. And it's also not a, camp it's not a campaign where we think this is actually going to prevent people from using drugs. Um, we should be spending the money that's being spent on that campaign uh, to ensure uh, quality treatment for all those who, who want it. We should be promoting harm reduction initiatives and there are some at the local level, but he and himself is a very conservative person. And, and that's a concern then on who would have influence over him to change his mind. I don't think that there is anyone, even institution or, or, or personally. And so that's where then I think, unfortunately, I don't see that we're going to have large uh, reforms in this, in this administration. And in 2024, there are presidential elections. Uh, re-election is not allowed. So we're kind of waiting. And what we're seeing and what we're working on is then much more related with society and public opinion and people and the self-regulation that's happening. We can speak about that. Uh, the clubs that are popping up and much less towards the government because we don't see an opening and we don't see that they're uh, willing to engage in a, in a, in a larger dialogue. So you have kind of a social clubs in Mexico, right? Can you explain how they work? Sure, so, so they're beginning to emerge, this social club movement, in the sense that because you can have a personal authorization or permit to be able to, con to cultivate cannabis for personal use, people are getting together and they're saying, oh, if you don't have that permit, we have lawyers who can do the bureaucracy, who can carry out that process, and we can have a shared space where we consume together, we'll grow your cannabis so that we'll be providing it to you, and we will provide this legal protection should anything happen. And obviously the goal now, um, as they begin to emerge, and they're happening all over the country, not just in Mexico City, in fact, more in other states, we're seeing it because it's people who don't want to have to go to the illegal market and who want to have their own way of, su of supplying their own consumption. And so we're seeing different uh, agreements between cannabis clubs and communities that cultivate so that they can buy their product from them. And the goal now is how do we ensure quality? How do we make sure that these clubs are sending uh, possibly their, their cannabis to be tested in laboratories so they can have a sense of, of the analysis? How do we make sure that the people who are working there um, are given the labor rights that they need to have and that they are also informed and trained so that they understand. I mean, I think it's important for everyone to know about the conventions and the international drug control system because that does affect uh, the local policy making. But this is it, within this legal vacuum and this lack of, of impetus on the part of the government, that's where we're seeing this new sorts of organization, more cooperative models uh, emerging. And I would hope that they are accessible to all and that they don't put prices that make it 
um, me that mean that people who don't have resources won't be able to be part of these kind of social clubs that are that are popping up. And this is part of the peace building and social justice means of let's make sure that as we move forward in these self-regulations that we have that in mind. And a final question. We are in, in Vienna now at the International Center. So how do you see the trends at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs here? Like how, how does it affect what, what's happening in Mexico? Well, I think the policy making that happens here is quite detached from the reality. Um, but we see Mexico on a whole as a country playing a progressive role in these debates. They're pushing for language that talks about human rights, that recognizes the harms of policies and also drug use, possible harms. And so we do see them playing that role, but it's hard because everything's relative. So it's in comparison to other countries that are very prohibitionist, they can play that role along with now Colombia um, and, and some other Latin American and European countries that are really pushing this, these different ideas. You know, another thing that, that Mexico was very involved in was the omnibus resolution in New York in October, where for the first time, instead of it being a consensus-based document, it was voted on, and it, it, it's a much more progressive document. And that was a, a strategic move by the embassy in, Me in, in New York to kind of change the way they had been doing policy making. So it'll be interesting to see how that's uh, received in these spaces. Um, and I think that the trends at the CND are shifting. I mean, there are more countries that are taking uh, uh, stances that are a bit more progressive. There are more countries within, that have jurisdictions that are promoting other models. We heard from Malta and their social club model. Um, so we're just continuing to, to see how some of those tides are shifting. And obviously the big uh, news here will be if Bolivia uh, calls for a declassification of the coca leaf and a critical review from the World Health Organization. So we're kind of uh, waiting for that to, to be a reality and see whether that could be one of our one of the work areas for the next couple of years. And so I think the CND is changing. And obviously for us from civil society, it was just wonderful to after three years come together, be able to talk, catch up and, um, and align the movement again. Thank you so much for the interview and good luck with your advocacy work in Mexico. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.